Hi, everyone, and welcome to the fourth episode of the Albums Only Podcast. My name is Alan Beavers, uh, and alongside me, as always, is Jacob Slater. And today, we're going to talk about uh, the fourth album that we've chosen to do is the uh, Twin Peaks soundtrack. We wanted to get, uh, you know, in our ever-expanding quest to conquer all things and all subjects album-related, uh, we wanted to do a soundtrack, and we wanted to do one, uh, an album in particular from the 1990s, as we try to spread things out fairly evenly here. And uh, what with the revival of, of Twin Peaks on Showtime and everything else that's going, you know, going on with Twin Peaks, how much of a cult hit it's become, and everything uh, that goes on like that, Jacob and I thought that would be a great place to start with the fourth podcast, is with the, the Twin Peaks soundtrack. Uh, I mean, is there a more iconic... TV show soundtrack, maybe, but uh, in cult circles, I don't think so, and it's sort of fever dream jazz sound is um, well known as sort of the sound of Twin Peaks. Jacob, what are your thoughts on um, Twin Peaks and the Twin Peaks soundtrack? Both of us, huge fans of the show Twin Peaks. I think the music has a lot to do with it. I think it kind of, the way that uh, Angela Badalamenti and uh, uh, David Lynch kind of crafted uh, this sound is what helps sets it apart from not only shows that were around in the early 90s, but even today, I think it kind of sets the show apart musically from anything that's going on today. Uh, what was the... Uh, when was the first time you were you became aware of Twin Peaks, Beavs? You know, that's really interesting, actually. Um, I find these are the best stories, by the way. This is just our fourth podcast. But, like, when were you first aware of? When did you first hear? Those stories are interesting to me. So, around in the early 2000s, maybe even, maybe even before that, maybe even in the late 1990s, my mother <laughs> always watched ABC shows. Don't ask me why. She has some sort of affectation for ABC, but, um, you know, she loved ABC television shows, and one of the things uh, that she always talked about when I was younger, when I was old enough to start watching television and enjoying it, you know, alongside her, was Twin Peaks, and that she was sort of sad that I didn't get to see Twin Peaks and said that I would have loved Twin Peaks, and um, and that was my first memory, is my mother telling me about how much I loved it, and then as soon as I was old enough to, before Netflix existed, which there was a time, by the way, uh, for some people out there, I bought the, the DVD set and uh, loved it. I mean, it, it just um, devoured it um, rapaciously. And, and it, it, I thought it was great. It just, it, it's just so atmospheric. It just takes you directly into these lives. It's so Lynchian. I mean, it's its own word now, obviously, but it's so... It, there's a soap opera aspect to it, but it's also so dark and twisted. And that's David Lynch, and, and uh, it, it truly spoke to me. So uh, so how about yourself, Jacob? It was actually, and uh, we're all tying it back around to U92, uh, when I first joined the station, uh, Twin Peaks was, it was very popular. A lot of people that were in the station at the time really enjoyed it. So I kind of, I guess by social osmosis kind of became aware of it and uh, eventually decided to check it out. Watched through the whole series. Can't tell you how I felt about it at the time because how I feel about it now has become so strong. Uh, but, you know, watched the whole series, enjoyed it, you know, except for that season two cliffhanger. The good news there is you get, you get, uh, you get a, a reprieve to that cliffhanger. 25 years later, we get a reprieve. So. That's true, and uh, although we won't be spoiling anything for the new series, I think, I think we're both watching it and we're both enjoying it. We don't want other people to not enjoy it. I mean, it's, it's just, it is a show that at the time was very revolutionary. I mean, you didn't really see serialized storytelling in television. Like, that was a new thing. Musically, was different, like... In primetime, in primetime television, you mean, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, the atmosphere it gave, which, you know, David Lynch, although you could call him a surrealist filmmaker, his, his style is kind of, not only visually, but kind of how he kind of crafts a world, is so distinct, like, so different from other stuff on television. I mean, he 
it's like it's a murder mystery, but it's also kind of a parody of a soap opera. And then there's this supernatural, almost Lovecraftian horror going on. And like all this stuff coming together into this bizarre whole. It's fascinating to me because I think it. The interesting thing to me is it works on so many levels, right? It works as a, like a love story soap opera that any you know the stereotype would be middle aged woman would would love because it's got sort of the atmosphere and the music and it's all very you know you know a lot of face shots and just sort of like some of it's lovey dovey and it, you know that sort of works well. Then you have the surreal aspect. Um, the shots, the sort of the the the, the cinematography, it's, it's very light and fla- flowy and flowery and, and, and you know, faded out in a, sen- in a little bit of a sense. Um, so it works that way. And then it also works on the dark side, right, so those who like edgy things, because, you know, everything seems fine for several episodes, but then people break down and cry, and it's more than just, like, a soap opera. Yeah. I mean, it's, like, in the first episode where they're going around, you know, the news of Laura Palmer's death goes out. You know, you have people breaking down and crying, and it's in some ways it's almost laughable. You know, it, it's a sad scene, but it's laughable because the music is so like saccharine and like schmaltzy, and it's and it's endearing because it's it's kind of it's all it's knowing too, right? Like it knows what it's like. David Lynch knows what he's doing. He knows he's doing that. This isn't like. It's a tongue-in-cheek sort of sense to it. Like, it knows what it's doing. You know, it knows. Now, I don't want to make it sound like Twin Peaks is self-aware or anything. But, I mean, they know what they're doing with the show. They know it's, it's schmaltzy and, and sort of silly and, and, and corny like that. But they're doing that on purpose. I mean, yeah, that's kind of like, if you look through Lynch's filmography, I mean, Twin Peaks really kind of is a, a great example of what Lynch likes to do as a filmmaker, which is to kind of contrast society's surface with kind of kind of the underneath, the subtext, if you will. And I think Blue Velvet would be probably probably the closest ex- example of a film that kind of parallels Twin Peaks, at least the first two seasons. The new season reminds me more of, there's some scenes that remind me of Mulholland Drive. There's some other scenes that are really just far out there. So it, it's it's great, though, that, that um, the series knows this, and it's evolved between season two and season three. I mean, 25 years will do that to you, but it's just interesting that, that it's moved on like that. Honestly, I don't know what I would have expected before Twin Peaks season three came out, I kind of assumed that, you know, we couldn't get what was now. Because there's like a whole, it's practically a lifetime between when, you know, Twin Peaks was on television and when it's on television now. I mean, we used to have soap operas on TV back in the days. And like soap operas now are like dinosaurs. You kind of like can't really parody soap operas, you know, in 2017 without it coming across as, like, you're kind of reaching back. Like, you got to stay modern. I think, although, and I'm not disparaging the new season of Twin Peaks, I think it's fantastic. If you go into the new Twin Peaks expecting exactly what you got out of the old Twin Peaks, I don't think you're going to be having as much fun with it. If you go into it kind of expecting David Lynch... And I think you mentioned Mulholland Drive. I think that and Lost Highway. I think I think it really kind of exemplifies the mood and kind of the the new kind of atmosphere. Because this is after the dream is over. Coop is he's grown old. Everybody's kind of moved on. There's not really that Twin Peaks anymore. So now we're kind of we're in a new stage of our lives in that sense. What will be really interesting, I mean, obviously, th- this this part might not hold up well in months or years to come, but what will be really interesting, too, is if there's a green light to do even a fourth season. Because if the third season is largely, and this shouldn't be a spoiler alert because the president of Showtime has said this, if the, the third season is primarily Dale Cooper getting back to Twin Peaks, it, it begs the question, how much would you love to see a fourth season after that? And, you know, Showtime has reported that, that the, the subscription to, to Showtime is the most ever over a weekend period when Twin Peaks debuted. And um, it seems to be getting good ratings. People are talking about it. It's good water cooler buzz. 
So I'm, I'm hoping that um, this isn't the end. It, it might be, and if it is, that's fine. But it's enjoyable to, to have Twin Peaks back and to have a show that's really avant-garde sort of in the spotlight. I mean, even for a show, even for like a paid subscription service show, like Showtime, HBO, Stars, those sort of things, even for that, this is pretty avant-garde to do. Yeah, I've heard before that uh, David Lynch has decided he's done with filmmaking. But at the same time, I also know that it's been said that had he not been pressed, Twin Peaks would have never revealed who killed Laura Palmer. And it just would have kind of gone on and on. So I think the nature of Twin Peaks and like what David Lynch wants out of Twin Peaks might lend itself better to continuing on the story, you know, go deeper and deeper. But I think uh, I feel like this season is going to be kind of one of those seasons where there's enough mystery that you could go on, but I think it's going to kind of wrap things up in a lot of ways. So you, so fans don't feel like they missed out. Yeah, no, I, I hope you're right, and I, there's a small part of me that hopes you're wrong, just so I can see a little more. <laughs> you know, one of the interesting side notes here is Twin Peaks. Uh, in Twin Peaks, Fire Walk with Me, the the movie that that uh, was made alongside with Twin Peaks, if it didn't actually work out as a TV show, the movie that was made with it, which is an, another interesting story you could talk about. And there's there's an official Twin Peaks Fire Walk with Me album as well, it's just recently re-released. Uh, in all of its glory. It's beautiful, by the way, if you get a chance to look at it. Our, uh, in Fire Walk With Me, David Bowie makes an appearance, and he was set to reappear in the third season as the special agent he played if he was still Phillip alive. Philip Jeffries. There you go, Philip Jeffries. He would have played Philip Jeffries if he were still alive. So there's a tie back to our very first uh, Albums Only podcast. It all kind of leads back to Black Star. Like 100 episodes in, we're going to like be making callbacks but somehow, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, we don't get to see Philip Jeffries in the show itself. Unfortunately, a lot of the original actors for the show passed on before we could you know, get to this show. I believe M- Miguel Ferrar, who played uh, Albert, passed away. Don Davis, who played uh, Major Garland Briggs, passed away uh, a few years ago. So the only bad thing, I suppose, about making a continuation to a series 25 years after. That's true, but, you know, M- Miguel Ferrar did finish some um, scenes in the fil- in the the, um, the third season, so he actually will appear in the third season, and he finished his, you know, stuff for that. The Log Lady, unfortunately, she passed, but she finished her scene, or scenes, before, um, you know, she was gone. So, you know, at least we have that closure. A lot of them got a chance, but you're right, Briggs didn't, for example, so... I think at the end of the day, though, I mean, Twin Peaks just engenders this wonderful warmth because it was so odd and weird and compelling, and it really challenged primetime television. And it was really one of the first shows in 1990, 1991, especially into the 90s. It brought television into the 90s, and, you know, in so many ways, it was that sort of avant-garde centerpiece that we all look back on. And I think that's what it will be remembered for, and it will be beloved for that, and it will always be important to television. And on top of that, the album as well is the official soundtrack of that element is so very important to the TV show, and that's why we chose to do it. It's from the 90s. It's, it's so, so important to the TV show. It sets the tone with the TV show. So um, what are your opening thoughts or uh, feelings on the album there, Jacob? Like I said before, it, it just like gets exactly what David Lynch is going for in this series. I think it's a soundtrack that tells you exactly what the show is. If you hear this John Williams' Star Wars scene, you instantly get an idea of what uh, Star Wars is about. If you like hear Danny Elfman's Batman, like you instantly get an idea of what Batman is. And I think with the first track here, the Twin Peaks theme, you get exactly an idea of what Twin Peaks is about. Just like this surreal, dreamlike, unexplainable kind of sound that's at once kind of hip and modern and at the same time very kind of saccharine. It brings to mind like these soap opera theme songs, you know, something from like Dynasty or, you know, As the World Turns or something. But at the same time, there's like this kind of coolness to it. You got this kind of like the guitar that just goes echoes out into there, the brown, 
bam, bam, bam. That bass is, that's the most interesting thing. You know, what's really interesting to me is the first time I heard Destroyer's album Kaput, which I recommend that to anybody, love that album. Um, the first time I ever heard that, and I heard that there, there's there's that sort of bass line that's very similar to that bom bom kind of sound, and it I just made me think of Twin Peaks instantly. I mean, once you hear the Twin Peaks theme, you really almost don't forget it. Like it just gets in there, man. Especially if you see the opening sequence with the waterfall and everything, you're just kind of like that stays in people's minds. Period. It's just iconic. And just watching wood being cut, water slowly <laughs> falling right in the river. You know. And the weird thing is, listening to the song, it's kind of better than it is, like, when it's on TV. Because when it's, like, played as the opening theme, it always feels, like, a tiny bit too long. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Like, you're kind of, like, you expect it to end, but then it's like, no, wait, we're going to, like, it's a bit annoying, but I kind of like it in the sense that you're just forced to sit through this kind of slow song. (laughs) Well... That's a great point because, and this is even more true in season three, but even for television, I mean, this was the 90s, so there's a bit of a different standard, but the scenes are slow. They're slow developing, especially in season three. They take their time. They breathe. And it, I think there's something to be said for David Lynch and the theme song and the opening for getting you in the mood of sort of like, especially for me, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'm vibrating way up top. Like, I'm a pretty naturally have a lot of energy trying to get things done, blah, blah, blah. But this sort of sets the tone lower, right? It's sort of like, we're going to sit back and we're going to relax and you're going to watch right. Timber be soft. Slowly being <laughs> eased into the right. town of Twin Peaks. I think so, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very interesting. It's, like I said, it kind of like is very much of David Lynch's you know, philosophy for filmmaking in that it is a very kind of sweet, saccharine song for a show about a murder for the entire first season. It's about a gruesome murder. So the the contrasting tones between the music, which is light and fluffy and dream poppy, and the actual content of the show, which, you know, is about murder, you know, what we find to be like an, a web of lies and deceit, it, I think it, it it really works in context of the show. I think as a song itself, it's also very good. And and that actually sets a a beautiful sort of one of the things that I always think about with Twin Peaks too. I mean, when when you watch the show, there's sort of like a mannequin sort of vibe to it. There's like the good and the evil, and and there's that split. And I find that between the the Twin Peaks theme is sort of the good. When you hear that theme, it's usually good. There's usually, if it's even if it's the variation, like, and I'm sure we'll get to it, but even if it's the uh, love theme from Twin Peaks, even if it's that or it's um, the theme, it's the main theme itself, it's always sort of in love scenes and sort of in positive scenes. The counter to that is Laura Palmer's theme, which is also iconic, which which people who've watched the show have heard a thousand times. And it's sort of like that evil theme. It's sort of like that death-dying sort of sound. It's, I mean, I think it's first introduced when they find Laura Palmer's body. It's just, it's, it itself is very iconic. I think it's probably, aside from the theme itself, I believe it's probably the most played song in the show. I believe they play it at the end of the show. might be a slightly different song, but I believe. But, yeah, I mean... It's very kind of dark, but I think it also kind of, it's another song that I think encapsulates the essence of the show. Because it starts off very dark, very oppressive, seeing Laura Palmer dead and everything. But then, like, it builds up. Right, yes, great Into, point. like, this flower blooming out of the earth, almost. Right, it does have almost, like, you think it might turn, like, it might turn to more, to more beauty, and then it just sort of, like, the synth just sort of dies down, and it gets very dark again, and you hear, like, just sort of the low-end piano, and you know you're back to where you were. Like, you think, it's almost like you think you're going to escape, but then you don't. You know, it's it's it, yeah, it's somber and melancholy and bittersweet like that. It really works extremely well. It is a song that, as I said with Twin Peaks, it is a song that kind of tells you a lot about Laura Palmer's character because kind of the life of Laura Palmer 
as you see in the show, is kind of shrouded by this horrible stuff that happens to her, not only being murdered, obviously, but the lead-up to her murder, kind of the stuff you find out about what happens to her. And yet, still, there's this bit of beauty, goodness, and light that is able to peek through. Now, much like Laura Palmer herself, who's trapped in this darkness, and you, know, you still have this light that manages to shine through. And I think it is like a very beautiful song. I think it's often used in the show, especially in the first season, as kind of this background to what we would consider like overwrought scenes of grief. People going, oh, Laura Palmer. You know, like it makes the scene feel kind of ridiculous, but it is when it hits that peak, when it's kind of like it rises up, it is actually very beautiful. It is a very kind of heartbreaking uh, song. I think it kind of, it's that emotion shines through despite the the package that Lynch wraps it up in. Yeah, and I think uh, move on from that. And this is, I mean, what's interesting is the um, actual track listing of the soundtrack is naturally geared towards the songs that you hear in the order of the series. And, and probably the third most recognizable of the songs is Audrey's Dance. And, uh, you know, Audrey sort of serves as the, I hate to use this term, but I'm going to use it, the shit stirrer for Dale Cooper so that he can sort of uncover what's going on in Twin Peaks, sort of the nasty underbelly. And the song fits nicely because it sort of has that mischievous kind of tone to it, like, I wonder what I can get into. What's going on? What is my father up to, and how can I understand it better, and how... Can I get into One Eye Jacks? And that's what you. This is the song you'll often hear when it's playing, and it's perfect. It's perfect for that that sort of bluesy kind of investigatory kind of like up to no up to mischief kind of sound. Smoky, jazzy kind of song. I think it's first played, I believe, in the Double R Diner when Audrey meets up with, I believe, Shelley and Bobby. Uh, she ends up playing this song on the jukebox one of the early episodes and it's it is audrey's song i think there's like some elements in this song where it kind of ends up it sounds like a cat meowing almost but it's really kind of trying to capture audrey's character as this person who's trying to appear you know more worldly and more dangerous than she actually is but at the end of the song i think a bit of like a chord progression that ties into the crescendo of Laura Palmer's theme. This beauty hidden within, like, Audrey's facade that she's put up. Well, I think they also do that again. I could be mistaken here, but I think in the Bookhouse Boys, there's a bit of a callback to the Twin Peaks theme. There's a couple different places where you sort of see that. It's a beautiful little touch because it's it's just sort of that running thread. That's, you know, any... I mean, we like callbacks, obviously. We've made a few in the first couple um, episodes of our podcast, but... I think it's great when, whenever you, you hear that and you sort of get that callback to, to the central theme. Kind of adds so much to, like, Audrey's character and kind of her own perception of herself. I like the cool snaps right. that go on. Yeah. Making you feel like you're in West Side Story or something. <laughs> it's, it's very smooth jazz. It's just, um, it's very, sm- I mean, it's like, it's just cool. I mean, it's a throwback to a time when you held out a lighter to someone's cigarette and lit it up for them, and there was a sexual tension and th- that sort of thing. You know, and that's just yeah. the femme fatale, right? And that's what Audrey wants to be. Yes. So let's go ahead and um, let's move on to the Nightingale, which, and I, I have to preface this: I love Julie Cruz. She sings this song, and she has an album that was released actually in 1989 called "Falling Into the Night." The Falling Into the Night also appears on the show. I think the whole song, too. Like, I think it's one of the rare instances. I mean, imagine an early 90s television where someone performs a whole five-minute, four, four or five-minute song in an episode of a show. I mean, th- that, that in itself probably almost never happened at the time. I, I don't know the history of that, but almost probably never happened. And Julie Cruz is basically, you know, performing this as Dale Cooper it enters into a nightclub. And the album, though, 1989's Falling Into the Night, is gorgeous. I mean, it's basically a lot of a lot of the same themes and tones from Twin Peaks are there. It's amazing, and I, and I encourage you to seek it out 
It's, uh, it's really great. There's three tracks represented here that are also on Falling Into the Night. But if you love Twin Peaks and you love the Twin Peaks soundtrack, even if you like them, you will love Julie Cruz. She's great. I think the songs that you hear on this album, they're very modern at, for the time, very dream poppy, speaking to bands like the Cocteau Twins, the Cowboy Junkies, My Bloody Valentine. But they're also old school songs. I think the Nightingale in particular is like, without all the trappings, you know, the kind of the ambiance, it's it's basically just a old school rock and roll song. Something like you'd hear from like Chuck Berry or something. Like yeah, like I only have eyes for you would be like a good like they're all kind of variations of that sort of like dreamy love song, you know, something like that. It is the Twin Peaks way to call back to these kind of halcyon days of the past, which Nightingale does with its rock and roll roots, but call back to it in a way that invokes even more nostalgia. Rock and roll itself is being portrayed as a dream almost with the Nightingale. And uh, this song, I don't know if it's the first song that Julie Cruz performs on the show. I assume it is just because it's the fourth track on there. But the characters go to the Bang Bang Bar, I think it's what it's called. That's right. Which is like the biker bar. And then uh, she's performing this song right before, I think, the big fight scene between like Bobby and Mike. Right. Well, you always think that's hilarious. Like, could you imagine a real-world scenario where you walk into a, a biker... A, I can't imagine a real-world scenario where I walk into a biker bar. But B, can you imagine one where you walk in and it's just like that sort of dream pop and Julie Cruz is up there performing and the bikers are all enraptured, like they, they won't stop watching her? Like, <laughs> it's just so hilarious to me. Yeah, it's, it's very odd when you, like just get right down to it that these kind of tough guys would be listening to this music. And it's continued on into season three of uh, Twin Peaks. Every episode so far has ended with a musical performance at the Bang Bang. Although Julie Cruz herself has not made an appearance, but it's, it's, a, it's a carryover from her performances in the original series. And apparently she will, by the way. She's on the credits and she will appear in season three, which is... Great. I'm looking forward to that. But I think it's interesting. You had mentioned, and I think this is true of almost all of David Lynch's characters, he tries to play with that, with sort of like the stereotype, right, of like the ideal woman, which is sort of this femme fatale, this sort of beautiful woman who's a little dangerous and you don't know what she's up to, but yet you can't resist her. And then also sort of like the macho male, but like, like, I, like we had talked about, right? They're listening intently to this sort of dream pop kind of this macho male, but who's a really a softy deep down. It's sort of playing with these ideal characteristics of what, what each sex sort of thinks that they want or the sort of like ideal of what they want. So there's a little bit of playing with that too, which is really fascinating. I think I'm going to flat out say that all of the Julie Cruz songs on this soundtrack are worth listening to because they're excellent. I think Nightingale is like one of my personal favorites. Though. Yeah, I, I, my favorite will be coming up. We'll get to that one in a second. Then we, we move on from that, follow the track list down, to Freshly Squeezed, which is a very sort of investigative, uh, again, very smoky, very Dale Cooper and One-Eyed Jacks playing it cool sort of thing going on. I don't know if it is meant to be like a reprise of Audrey's Dance or not, but it definitely sounds a lot like a return to Audrey's Dance. Uh, I think there's like a bit of, bit more keyboard, I think it is, that's kind of just like rolling along in the song. It's not a, kind of feels like a bit of a intermission song almost, or an interlude song, where it's, it, it's not like it's fully formed as Audrey's Dance, but you, it's kind of like, kind of like continues the thread, carries the theme without, you know, deviating too strongly. I don't remember a specific moment where this song in particular comes into play. I, I want to, I want to say it's often at the police station if they're investigating or something like that, or they're they're onto a hunch or they're sort of looking into something. I want to say that's generally when you hear that, and uh, I like that's one of my more favorite sort of, you know, underrated little tracks on the album. I like that one quite a bit. I also like Bookhouse Boys a lot. And this one also, it has flourishes where it's sort of, I don't want to say chaotic, but it definitely picks up more than other ones do. In the context of the show, uh, the Bookhouse Boys are a kind of secret organization that's been set up to kind of 
investigate the mysterious goings on in the woods. Sheriff Truman, Big Ed Hurley, former member Hank Jennings was part of that group, and Dale eventually joins that group as well. And yet it's a different kind of song in comparison to the other songs on the album so far. I would say, yeah, it is kind of very chaotic before fading into, you know, I think, maybe a bit of Freshly Squeezed, maybe a bit of uh, Laura Palmer's theme. It's also one of those songs that I don't really recall a specific moment where the song comes in. I think it, it's one of those kind of good intermission songs, interlude songs, where it kind of still captures the feel of the show without having to like directly reference a moment in the show. Well, and then after that, we get into Julie Cruz again, Into the Night. And this is, my, this is one of my absolute favorites, Julie Cruz songs, even from her album. Again, you definitely should check out 19, 1989's Falling Into the Night. It's gorgeous. But this song in particular, Into the Night, I love. I think it's the, the first track on the B side of her album. That's, that's how I remember it. Here, it's the seventh track if we're running down from the top. I love sort of halfway through, it's very sensuous, and then there's this peak of danger. The horns hit really big. They get really loud, and then it's silence, and then it drops back into the song, and that is gorgeous. I mean, it's perfect. I, there, there, there are certain moments in songs that you remember, and that one, it just makes your spine tingle. You know, I have it down in my notes is that it's almost like a James Bond theme. It is. She, that This would be, she would be perfect for a James Bond theme. It's, it's gorgeous. You're absolutely right. Great thought. A, a James Bond movie directed by David Lynch. Oh, boy. So, <laughs> that would be... That would be interesting. I don't even know how that would work, but I would definitely watch that film. I feel like there'd be very little action, but, like, I would be enthralled the whole time. <laughs> like a spy film that takes place in, like, this bizarre dreamscape. But, yeah, it's compared to, like, The Nightingale, which is kind of like this warm dreamy song and tonight kind of like contrasts it a bit by being a bit darker colder i think there's like some cello in there as well yeah no it, it is it's a great point like i said it's it's sensuous and dark and sort of scary you're having fun but you're doing it in a way that if you get caught there are consequences and then there's that big scare in the middle that that sort of the, the horns jump and you don't see it coming like especially Especially if you listen to her. If you're listening to her album and you hear that, there's nothing else like that really before it. It's all very, like, dream pop, and you don't get that scare. And when you get it, it really takes you aback. You do not see it coming, and uh, it just works so well. Well, that leads us uh, on to Nightlife and Twin Peaks. I have to tell you, if, there, if I had to pick one song that's probably the most forgettable, it's probably this. Uh, unfortunately, it, it works just fine. It's sort of... Nightlife in Twin Peaks is sort of a, a play off of the Bookhouse Voice and Freshly Squeezed, but doesn't really have too much thematic elements in it. It's just sort of it's a little chaotic, just, you know, just sort of more, more jazzy in that it's sort of free to move about more. I mean, if you consider the, in the context of the show, nightlife in Twin Peaks tends to be the most dramatic, the most action-filled moments of the town, of the town's life, I guess. Uh, Laura Palmer is murdered during the night. I think a lot of the big reveals going on during the show, this chaos that's kind of bubbling under the surface of Twin Peaks. And you only really see that darkness during the night. Right, again, again, playing with that Manichaean sort of aspect, right? The good and the evil, the light and the dark. The, I mean, I think that's a really big underlying theme here, and I think that's a great point. It sort of brings that out. And, yeah, I would probably agree with you that in terms of the album itself, it's probably least noticeable. But, you know, I think it, it kind of does, you know, what it's supposed to do, which is kind of to build the atmosphere of Twin Peaks and kind of, like, call back to the kind of the theme of Twin Peaks, which is this, this inherent danger in the night. And in Twin Peaks, darkness is, you know, scary. So that moves us onwards to Dance of the Dream Man, and this is sort of the Red Room song, right? I mean, this is just sort of the, the, the thing you hear in the Red Room. Interesting note, um, if you're a Simpsons fan, which I am, in uh, the Who Shot Mr. Burns episodes, this is sort of the song that they take and sort of spoof while they're in the, the Red Room, so to speak. 
So it's 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 uh, neat to see that reference to pop culture, and you can find it in The Simpsons. I think season six, season six to seven. So I think that's the cliffhanger in season six to seven. Uh, it could be five to six, but I think it's six to seven. Uh, your thoughts on uh, Dance of the Dream Man? And when we talk about the Dream Man, uh, we're referring to the character who first appears to Cooper in what is called the Red Room, which in the mythology of the show, I believe is supposed to represent kind of a waiting room or a purgatory between the two kind of major supernatural influences on the world, the White Lodge and the Black Lodge, uh, which if you watch the show, you'll find out a bit more about uh, the Black Lodge around season two, I'd say. It is definitely when... Cooper first meets the Dream Man that I don't know about you, but I think that's like the moment where you know this is not your average show. Right. We have just like stepped into a direction that is beyond what other people are doing. No, I agree. And and I love the back masking. So when they're when they're in the red room and they're and this is fascinating, you know, if you ever want to watch a documentary about this, the fact that the people actually are learning to say the words backwards, and then they're recording that and then playing it forwards. That's why when you're in the red room and that that their voice is so unique, they're actually saying the word back. They're saying the words backwards, recording it and then playing it backwards so that it appears forwards, and that's where you get the really weird sort of speech sound. That was definitely like the moment where I was like. Yeah, I think I'm really going to like the show. <laughs> right. It just, like, comes out of nowhere. Like, Coop just, like, falls asleep. I think he might have met the giant uh, before. I mean, you'll know the giant if you watch the show. But it kind of, like, it's the moment where, th- you know, things are going to go off the rails. Because Coop has already kind of showed himself in the series to be kind of, like, a weird character. Like, he seems like, you know, that's what's endearing about him, like, at first the first time you see him is that he's like a very kind of direct person. He's almost pushy in a way, but you feel like he's a very dedicated, driven police officer, even though later on he starts like going into like Tibetan investigative techniques. You're like, I I don't know what this guy has to do with Tibet, but I I still think this guy is like on the level. He's still kind of normal. Diane, make as many notes as possible here because this is a really good point. And then, you know, he meets the Dream Man in the Red Room, which is a sentence that only really makes sense when you're talking about Twin Peaks. And he's just like, all right, something is now definitely happening. A strange short man in my dreams is, like, talking to me. And, like, it is coming true in real life. Like, I'm, I'm discovering that things that he talks about in the dream are coming true in reality. When you consider, like, how large a focus the Red Room and the Lodges, and, like, all these uh, characters that are, like, revealed, like, just from this, that moment, and how much it is, like, focused on and, like, expanded upon, especially in, like, the third season. Like, the Lodge stuff kind of takes a much larger focus than it used to. I think it's, it's like, one of the defining moments of the show, I think, is the Red Room. And Dance of the Dream Man is, I think, is another one of my favorite songs on this album. You know, we talked about Audrey's dance being cool jazz. This is, like, the coolest <laughs> cool jazz. That's a great it's, it's And it's music that you want to dance to. Like, dancing is in title, and it's a song that you'd be like, yeah, like, I want to... I want to get down to this song. I just want to, like, snap my fingers and, like, move around. Like, it's it's a very... And wear a bidet. Great song. Yeah. That, and that saxophone that goes on. I oh, love yeah. that saxophone. I'll probably make a mention every episode of this podcast how much I love saxophone. And, like, this is the <laughs> saxophone song on the album. You know who was a good saxophone player? Mm. David Bowie. No, I'm not sorry. That's true. That is true. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I had to do the callback. So... From Dance of the Dream Man, we move on to the love theme from Twin Peaks, which is essentially just the Twin Peaks theme, but with woodwinds. I mean, that's basically all that we have here. Did you have any other comment on it? Or uh, Well, I thought it uh, reminded me a bit more of uh, Laura Palmer's theme. Really? Okay. And, yeah, it's 
done with uh, woodwinds rather than like the synthesizer. And uh, I don't know, there's not too much to say about it, except I kind of I kind of like it. I think it's slightly a bit more than Laura's Palmer's theme. The fact that it's not synth, you know, it's woodwind rather than synth, kind of like lessens the kind of heaviness. That's a, you're absolutely right. It, it is Laura, it's a, it's, a, it's a riff on Laura Palmer's theme and not a riff on the Twin Peaks theme. But um, but yeah no absolutely it's more mellow it's again I, again there's not really not that piano the piano is not really present so you don't get sort of that undercurrent that's quite as dark I think that's what sort of makes uh, Laura Palmer's theme as dark so and, and it's a fine it's a fine piece but um, uh, at this point you, you're ten tracks in it's just sort of a you know theme and variation sort of track nothing too special there and it's not uncommon obviously in soundtracks to have a quieter than the original. And, but still a beautiful song. Right, and so moving on, it, it um, closes with uh, Julie Cruz once again with Falling. Any thoughts there? I mean, we're ending where we began, uh, basically. Uh, Julie Cruz's Falling is pretty much the theme song of Twin Peaks. There's only, the only real difference I can remember is that I think there's like a, a little bit of guitar around the crescendo. Is the only like real difference, but uh, as for the song, I, the instrumental version itself, I think, really kind of defines the show. As I said, it's like it's a very good song. It really does what it's supposed to do. And falling, it just improves it in a lot of ways. Right, adding the vocals it, it, again. Falling is essentially just the Twin Peaks theme with with Julie Cruz's vocals uh, underneath at certain points. I agree with you. I think it takes an instantly recognizable theme and then adds some, you know, beautiful vocals to it. And how can you go wrong? It's pretty much as the other Julie Cruz songs. It's lyrical content is very much simple, romanticized or idealized kind of idea of romance. When I saw your face, I believe is like the chorus. We sometimes forget that uh, voices themselves are instruments of their own they can like add or detract from performance just as much as a guitar or a drum or a drum kit can this is a song that really kind of shows how much a voice can add to a song because julie cruz's vocals like very whispery they're very kind of low in the mix but when you get that when you just get an ear for it where she suddenly kind of comes in it's, it's beautiful it's heart-wrenching ends the album nicely. It's a callback to the to the, the start. Twin Peaks, massively influential. I, you know, I don't have a whole lot more to add, except that you see it, I, I see it in a lot of different places. I, I enjoy uh, video games, so if you like Twin Peaks, I recommend that you check out um, the video game Deadly Premonition. It's extremely interesting. It's not great in terms of controls, but it is such a unique story and so much fun, and it's so obviously directly inspired by Twin Peaks. I think a lot of people, if you like video games and you and you like Twin Peaks, maybe if you love both uh, for some, you, you'd have to love both. But if you did, you'd love Deadly Premonition. It's very unique and fun, and, and uh, it forces you to, to take things slow, much like Twin Peaks does. I've watched the original show, I think, at least twice completely. I've seen the movie. I own Deadly Premonition. I've read uh, the book that they put out, uh, The Secret History of Twin Peaks, and I'm um, watching, which is a pretty good uh, supplementary material. If you haven't checked it out, I believe it's written by Mark Frost, who was the co-creator of the show. And I'm currently watching uh, season three, and I'm as happy watching it now, I think, as I was watching it then. I love seeing the world kind of come together. I love seeing all the different characters and their weird idiosyncrasies latch up together. I love the kind of surrealist tone, the Lovecraftian almost tone of the show. It is, it is still one of the more unique shows on television. I think it's, it's one of my favorite shows of all time. That is going to do it for the episode four of the Albums Only podcast. We're going to be back next time. We're going to talk about Leonard Cohen. The songs of Leonard Cohen. We're really looking forward to that. And uh, thank you so much for listening. You can catch us on Twitter at Albums Only. You can also email us at albumsonlypodcast at gmail.com. We look forward to your comments. Jacob, as always, thank you for joining me, and uh, we'll see you guys next time.